school. God, I... <laughs> Uh, so just real quick, so uh, I am the CTO for Broncos, and uh, basically it's a uh, small fintech uh, startup. We have employees all across all of Southeast Asia, and uh, we are hiring. Uh, and we're probably one of the few companies can, that can legitimately say 100% of our back end is written in Go. Uh, so we're looking for all positions, not necessarily developers, uh, but you know even things like country managers for here in Vietnam or wherever, and we... Uh, so what we do is we build uh, open banking APIs for banks and, uh, you know, for example, one of the banks here in Vietnam actually uses our uh, systems. So what I'm going to uh, talk to you about today is Gunk. So Gunk is a technology that we've built uh, in-house at uh, Broncos over the last couple of years. Um, and by the way, this little uh, gopher here is actually the Go Jakarta gopher. Uh, I'm also the founder of Go Jakarta, which is the largest uh, Go user meetup in the world. Um, and it's pretty cool. We're actually uh, running a conference uh, in March. So if you guys are interested in coming out uh, for that, please uh, stay tuned for some more announcements and stuff like that. So these slides are actually available online. You can use Go Get to uh, get the uh, slides if you're at all interested. So if you want to follow along at home or whatever the case may be. Uh, so real quick, uh, before I get into this, uh, is anybody here using protocol buffers for either gRPC or for some other RPC mechanism today? Okay. Who here is using Go for their gRPC APIs or other APIs that are implemented using protobuf? Okay, so you're the intended audience. It's actually a pretty big uh, swath, so uh, you guys should be pretty excited about this. Or at least I am. So uh, just to give a, an overview for those who are not uh, kind of experts on gRPC or what protocol buffers are, uh, is basically uh, protocol buffers is a technology designed by Google uh, for the serialization and deserialization of data, uh, you know, either on the wire or for storage on disk or for whatever it is. It's basically a type safe um, you know, definition, it has a one-to-one -one mapping to JSON, uh, it has a one-to-one -one mapping to uh, REST APIs, and uh, what it's really nice is that it allows you to define your APIs, uh, you know, kind of outside of a, uh, you know, programming language, and then you're able to generate kind of the serialization and deserialization for that programming language without having to, you know, rewrite all of that same code. Uh, which, if you've ever done that before, it's, it's actually very extensive. Um, and so what's really nice is that Protobuf specifically does not prescribe a specific like API implementation, meaning that uh, you know, you're kind of up to define your own, and that's basically where gRPC comes in. Uh, so gRPC is an RPC implementation that is designed around HTTP2. Uh, again, it's built by the same kind of team at Google, and so you get kind of this really high-end uh, level support. You know, gRPC is uh, kind of equivalent to something like, you know, Thrift, if you're familiar with that technology. Um, but what it does is it, it takes advantage of the uh, protobuf definitions uh, in a way to essentially create APIs that are uh, you know, fast, secure, efficient, and basically stream-based. So they take advantage of HTTP2 streams. Um, so you can do some real-time APIs and, and things of that nature. Uh, but what's really great about gRPC is that it, it really allows developers to focus on writing business logic or like real code and not have to worry about, you know, thinking how does how does this you know, remote procedure call get executed, right? That's just kind of left up and it's assumed that it can happen. And I'm, I'll take you through uh, kind of what we built Gunk for and uh, hope to show you kind of like how you can leverage gRPC very quickly using Gunk. So just uh, some quick background uh, at Broncos. 100% um, of our APIs are written in Go uh, and all of them are gRPC based. Uh, it just so happened that gRPC came out slightly before the launch of our company. And before, before, we, uh, before gRPC, I as a developer had basically been using you know, Thrift and uh, some other similar technologies. And I just thought it was you know, serendipitous that 
uh, when gRPC came out, uh, you know, we were launching our company and I just made a kind of a, a quick decision to just use that versus any other technology just because I figured it would be uh, work somewhere else. The, the problem with it though is that um, we have a lot of repositories that we manage uh, as a company. We've got, I think, well over a hundred different uh, Git repositories. Uh, some have API definitions, some do not. Uh, but what basically has occurred in kind of our growth over the last three years is that a lot of the services have been, you know, become scattered and they've been built by different teams and different, you know, developers over the years. And there's never really been a standard way to essentially generate uh, the code. It's basically been a bunch of ad hoc shell scripts or uh, there hasn't been uh, shell scripts and people just manually execute it. Maybe it's documented in a readme file or maybe it's not documented at all. And as we were scaling up uh, in terms of the number of repositories, this started to become a, a real problem. Uh, the other kind of issue was is that uh, you know, a lot of our hires at Broncos are not very familiar with Go. They might come from a Node.js or a Ruby background or, or Java or whatever else. Uh, we don't necessarily, you know, hire only Go developers because if we did that, we would have no developers. Um, but one of the issue is, is that for a lot of our new hires, you know, they were kind of tasked. They had to learn Go and then they also had to learn, you know, protobuf in order to be effective at writing definitions. And um, while that's not that big of a deal, it's just, you know, it's just an additional cognitive difficulty that people have to overcome when they're uh, coming to start work for us and, and they have zero experience with our systems or, or our APIs. Um, so the other kind of thing was, is that it was becoming very, very difficult to manage all of our CI pipelines. You know, for the hundred or so repositories we have, um, I want to say something like 95% of them have full automated CI CD deployments uh, in some kind of a fashion, either running unit tests or, you know, doing automated deployments to a, you know, to a, a cloud service or something like that. Um, and what was happening is that the CI CD pipelines were getting broken all the time because people would update their definitions, but they didn't know that they then had to run the, the protobuf generators to then update the definitions on disk uh, and then add that to the source repository and commit it to. So uh, this you know, was just kind of a problem, at, a problem just simply at scale when we were you know, getting bigger. It caused a lot of additional headaches that weren't necessary, essentially, or at least what I thought was not necessary. So, um, the, the other thing that was kind of basically happening for us is that we had a lot of senior developers who were very experienced with, for example, you know, protobuf and with gRPC, and they were getting extremely frustrated that when we would onboard somebody, it might take them you know, two, three, it could take like two months to get up to speed to like, you know, start being effective, which means from point of hire to somebody, you know, starting to be able to write code, uh, there was a, a, a big delay there. Uh, and also kind of the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, uh, developers tend to be opinionated. And so there was a lot of disagreement and argument about how things should be structured. Uh, meaning, you know, should we, uh, you know, should it be V1 or V2 or whatever? Um, so anyways, uh, early 2018, we decided enough, let's fix this once and for all. And uh, basically we decided that, you know, if we actually made our syntax based on Go, uh, you know, we could move a lot faster. There would no longer be kind of this overhead to learn protobuf. And, you know, protobuf comes from a kind of an old generation of technology that, you know, internal at Google uh, and they don't necessarily have the same problems we do because they've long, they long ago built their own internal tools to fix this, um, you know, to fix their ecosystem and, and their, their, you know, source repositories and all that stuff. But what we decided we could do is that we could standardize this code generation by creating a single tool that was project-based, meaning that we have a single parent configuration file for a repository that lists all of the generators that are used with protobuf uh, for generating the code or the dependencies. Uh, keep in mind that when we generate uh, code for protobuf, uh, 
we're not just generating Go code. We, we might be generating JavaScript, or we might be generating Python bindings, or uh, you know, we might be generating documentation files, or whatever. There's a huge swath. There is really no limit to what you can do with the protobuf, uh, with the proto C toolchain, essentially. You can write a, and it's very simple and easy to write your own generator uh, to do things. And, and at Broncos, we have our own internal generators for, for some certain things. So we invented gunk. Um, so basically, gunk is what I like to call a modern front end and syntax to protocol buffs. It's not that it's different. Um, the only thing that's different about it is its syntax. It works more or less as a drop-in replacement, and including the ability to basically do, uh, you know, live conversion from, uh, sorry, uh, to do easy conversion from existing protobuf definitions because there's a direct one-to-one -one mapping between existing protobuf definitions and the gunk syntax. Now, I, I just want to emphasize that I did not invent the gunk syntax. It's just literally Go syntax. Uh, and I'm going to show you some examples of it, and hopefully I'll do some live demonstrations of, of writing code. But what's really nice is that when you work with gunk for using protobuf definitions, is that it, it drops in and it works exactly the same kind of way, for example, the Go command line tools work, meaning you have things like gunk format or gunk convert uh, or gunk build, et cetera, uh, that, uh, you know, allow you to, make, uh, to take advantage of it. So what we found is that this has really reduced the cognitive load for our new developers, and uh, it makes them, it allows them to really get up to speed very, very quickly with writing real APIs and real services. Um, and quite frankly, in my opinion, I feel that it's a, just a much better, more streamlined workflow and much easier to understand uh, and less prone to human error. So. I, before I get into kind of the technical example of this, I do want to emphasize that I don't personally have any kind of a problem with protobufs. It's perfectly fine and acceptable. All that it is is that gunk is something that we've developed internally uh, that, that I've wanted to basically share with people because in the hopes that maybe it kind of, you know, helps other people as well in the same way that it's helped us. So <laughs> that said, uh, one more standard, right? Um, you know, uh, but that's kind of one of the things that I like to emphasize with Gunk is that it's not really a new standard. Uh, I instead of instead of like basically coming up with my own random out of the box syntax, uh, you know, it's just basically applying Go syntax and using that for defining protobufs. Okay, so now we can actually get into the, the technical side, and I hope you can understand the background and history of like where this tool came from, and maybe uh, I can help explain uh, or show how to, how to use it and how you might be able to adapt it for your own workflow. Um, so it's, what's really nice about Gunk as well is that you know, we've built it around Go modules. So we use Go modules to version our API definitions in the exact same way that you use Go code to version your, uh, sorry, you use Go modules to version your uh, you know, Go packages. Um, but just to give you a quick overview, uh, so there's a one-to-one -one mapping of protobuf to Go syntax essentially with, with our implementation, which is uh, we define services using interface. We use messages defined as structs. We use types for any other type that you want to define within, uh, you know, protobuf. And options uh, are still standard Go code, except that uh, because there is no metadata parser or metadata ability within Go, at least not in the same kind of a, a way, what we do is we define it as plus gunk and then the expression. And then, then that expression is basically any valid Go expression can be your definition of uh, you know, metadata for use within uh, protobuf files. Okay. And that, those options, if you're familiar with protobuf, how you use options in protobuf, uh, these annotations, uh, these, plunk, these plus gunk annotations are basically put in the doc comment doc comment before any interface struct type or field within a, uh, a struct, and it'll work exactly the same way as it would in the, the protobuf definition. So this is a, a real gunk, 
full working definition. And I, I, I want to just basically, um, you know, sh take you through it and, and in, you know, show you what's happening, which is basically we've got uh, the comment at the top is just the source file. As I mentioned before, you can go and download this off of, uh, you know, my slide, uh, my slide uh, Git repository. Uh, but look, if you're familiar with protobuf, you have just the, the type message. So as opposed to defining a separate message in protobuf, you just say type whatever name you want, struct, and then you just add the fields in exactly the same format and syntax as you would with Go code. Uh, and I would like to point out that the, uh, I forget the, what were these, these annotations that come after it for the, that indicate, for example, in the parser like, you know, PB1, if you're familiar with protobuf, this gets propagated into the actual generated files in the same way, and, and interacts exactly the same way as like, for example, PB is. So, the, the deal is, is that this is actually working compilable Go code, and you no longer have to actually define a separate file. It could be the same file. We're using the .gunk file extension simply because we want to, you know, not, it won't compile with the Go uh, build tool, but it will work with, with gunk, basically. Now, here's the other kind of types, is that we use type status int. This is kind of a special thing, but this maps to enums within uh, your protobuf definitions, and you can see that you know, IOTA works exactly the same kind of way. And if you wanted to do a more complex IOTA expression, like two, you know, left shift, one, or whatever, uh, with IOTA, you can also do that in our definitions. Just FYI. So this is uh, another message here, which is a check status response. Um, and then basically, the way that this would be used is that if you wanted to define an actual real API service, i.e. a gRPC service, you just use interface. So you just type the name interface and then you define the functions for your uh, RPC, right? For your gRPC methods or your implementation. Uh, in this case, it's echo message. Please note that this message here is basically mapped directly to that type that we define, oops. I, I, I don't know what I did. Is it, okay. All right, sorry. Um, so going back here, you see this type message works. And that type message there is then defined later on in the file there with echo message. And one of the major advantages of this is that, uh, I don't know if they've fixed this now in the protocol buffer compiler in the Proto C, but originally uh, you had to, uh, there was a, de uh, a definition dependency uh, in protobuf, meaning that you had to define your types before they were used, which sometimes, you know, when you're writing code, that, that's not very, you know, logical. Sometimes you want to just use the type before it's actually defined. And we've done that here because it, it has the same kind of semantics, you know, views uh, as, sorry, it has the same semantics and rules as standard Go code. So for example, you can define types out of order. They don't have to be magically interspersed. And similarly, since we're using Go modules, you can version your API definitions as package paths. And they map directly onto a, pack, onto a directory on a file layout and instead of using you know, Go files, it just uses gunk files instead of that. But it has the same semantics. The code would live in the exact same directory. So your definitions would always be next to the generated Go code, for example, uh, or whatever. It's actually a very powerful tool and it's very flexible. So just going on through my example. So this is where we get into kind of the cooler aspects. This is where I'm talking about this metadata. So Again, we're using the plus gunk annotations within the doc comment. This maps directly to uh, protobuf op options, if you're familiar with those. And for example, we find that this is just a lot easier to read. And this type that's inside of that, it's no different than any other gunk code. Now, you see that's HTTP.match. That needed to be imported here via these options. And we have these standardized options that basically map to the most common used gRPC methods out there. 
uh, if you're familiar with the, uh, the Google definitions. So that gives you a path, meaning that this is the exact path that this API would be exposed on for your REST-based APIs. If, you're, if, for example, you're using gRPC gateway, uh, which probably maybe a lot of people are or aren't, or maybe you're using some other kind of gateway, uh, whatever implementation you have that supports gRPC. So for example, if you're using a third party uh, API gateway like uh, you know, TIC or um, uh, uh, what is it? What is the other major one? I don't know. There's a, there's a lot that support like our you know, gRPC based APIs for API gateways. And that will work the same way. And so your API gateway will actually pick this up using the reflection API and use it and expose it directly on that path in the exact same way. There is no need to ever define a separate protobuf file. Okay, so the other kind of major feature about this is that, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, our biggest issue was that we had inconsistent uh, mechanisms by which different projects were generating the actual definitions. Uh, we had a, a, a random collection of shell scripts and stuff like that. And that was a problem, for example, our developers who are, who are on Windows who don't necessarily have Bash. So what's nice about Gunk is that since it's written in Go, it's, you know, it works universally across any platform. You can build it, compile it, install it using Go install. And then if you just put this .gunk config in the root of your file, you basically can very clearly uh, list everything that is it uses to generate it. And basically all it is is that you put these, stan these stanzas, this is a standard INI file type, or you know, INI files, if you're not familiar, are the same as like property files in Java or whatever it might be. Um, so you just say generate go, plugins is equal to gRPC, and th this is a direct mapping to the various uh, proto C buff, uh, sorry, the proto C command line uh, tools. Uh, uh, parameters or, or whatever it might be. Generate JS, generate Python, generate Swagger. So what's really nice is that we have a simple short file. It's standardized across all of our projects for all of our various you know, microservices. Uh, and so any person can open this, edit it, and know immediately which uh, third party dependencies are needed for the proto C generators and it will generate it for you. So what I want to show now is I'm going to get into like kind of a more hands-on technical demonstration, I, and I hope that this is uh, going to work properly. But basically, in order to get this to work, again, we're, we, are, we are committed as an organization to have an entire Go workflow. So all you have to do is you, if you wanted to use this on your own, is just do Go install, gunk, and then you know, just make sure that any other generator, any other proto C generator exists basically in your path somewhere. Whether that's the Proto C Gen Go, the Proto C Gen gRPC Gateway, or Proto C Gen Swagger. Uh, I'm specifically choosing these ones because these are the generators that are written in Go, and so they're easy to, uh, to demonstrate, basically. Uh, but then, basically, all you have to do is just do gunk generate based on that project config file. Uh, and it, with it uses the same package scope in the same way that the go build command uses. Uh, and that will generate the files and output them in a standard same consistent location. Um, alternately, you can also do a path on disk if you're like within a project root. And it'll, it doesn't matter where you are from within that project, it will always find the root of the project, i.e. where the .git directory is, and use that file at that root to basically generate uh, the code. So I, I just want to show you, like, based on that uh, definition uh, files that you had before, uh, basically, uh, what I want to show is on this gunk config file, so you also have the ability to change the out path for your definitions if you want to change it and, you know, whatever. But I just want to show you that what's happening is like if I list, if, that I, if I run this gunk generate on the code that I have available on my slides, you get basically these files. You see the all.swagger.json uh, that's been generated. You see the Python definitions, you have the JSON uh, file, sorry, the JavaScript files, and then you see that the gunk file, uh, the definition, which is echo.gunk, is there. Uh, 
And I, I'm going to show you then basically how you actually use this inside Go to write an actual API. So what we just covered was just simply the definitions, how to define an API service, and now I'll show you how simple it is using that in the direct one-to-one -one mapping of how to write an actual API uh, implementation. So this is the example server implementation. So you have to understand a little bit about protobufs, but just basically it comes down to uh, when you have a void function, i.e. A, a, a parameter list that is empty or a return parameter list that is, all, or sorry, a return value list that is also empty, you just have to use goog.empty. And this is a, this has something to, this is, this has to do entirely with the, um, uh, protobuf, the way protobuf gRPC implementation in Go, uh, you know, is actually implemented. Uh, but then we're importing basically our gRPC server package that implements the runtime for gRPC and then the reflection service, uh, which basically does the reflection aspects. Um, yeah. And then uh, I'm so uh, I'm importing, I'm giving it, you know, th this is the util path on, on disk. Uh, notice it's just a standard Go package, uh, and I'm calling it PB, which is just standard in the protobuf or gRPC world for how you define your API implementations. So those three uh, services, sorry, those three uh, API methods that were defined, uh, check status, echo, and update status are defined here. I, now I've left, the, I've left the bodies empty, but basically all it is here is that you've got your check status and you would like put in your actual implementation here. In this instance, it's not doing anything except that we're doing pb.checkStatus response and just passing back the enum, i.e. check status okay. And that's defined in exactly the same kind of way that, for example, uh, you know, you would do it in protobuf. So just to go back to the definition, just to show you, uh, here's what the check status response would look like. As you can see, all it does is it takes an empty parameter list for the input, and then it returns the actual response, which is just a type that was defined earlier. If you see the type here, you see the check status response. It has two fields, which are status and old field. Um, I've only added old field there just simply to show you that you can deprecate it using the uh, field.deprecated uh, mechanism which is a um, metadata option for, from within protobuf. So going here, as you can see, all I'm doing is I am returning the dot check status response. It's defined in the exact same definition file. And all the, basically the way the standard APIs work for any, uh, for any gRPC method is that basically you take a parameter, your inbound request, and then you return a response and an error. And if the error, if you return an error, it basically, the gRPC runtime will then, uh, you know, basically notify the client that's connected uh, when they call that RPC mechanism that, you know, some kind of an error has happened. And if you're not familiar with gRPC, just so you know, there's all kinds of like interceptors and things that you can build into your, you know, server framework, so to speak, that allows you to, you know, intercept these error methods and return you know, different types of, of responses uh, or do it to match your, you know, REST implementation or whatever you're trying to look for. So similarly here on Echo, note that I've got pb.message. This is my inbound request message. And then all I'm doing here on an implementation is just simply returning it because that's what an Echo message should do, right? It just echoes whatever was passed. All right, and then update status response is just left empty, but so be it. Okay, and then to get an actual microservice implementation done, this is the entire logic. It's seven, seven, eight lines of code. All it is is that you open up a listener on a channel, you set up your gRPC server, you do pb.register util server again, pb going back to the generated code from that uh, imported package. You do reflection.register, and then you just do a log.fatal on serve. And of course, if you needed to set up things like, uh, you know, SSL certificates or whatever, you would do it here. And then if you build it, run it, test it, uh, this is basically how you can do it. You would build it like this, go build minus O server, and then you can use, for example, gRPC curl, 
uh, GRP curl, I guess, to do plain text uh, connection. The reason I'm using plain text is because I'm not defining the SSL certificates. This is just simply for demonstration purposes and is not necessarily 100% reflective of what you might do in a production environment. And then you would get back your JSON status. Yeah? So just to show you that this is not fabricated, let me uh, show you how easy this is. And then I'm going to get into, sh to show you how easy um, it can be to uh, uh, essentially, if I can get this terminal window, ugh. Okay, why, why is the, does anybody have any idea how Mac OS works anymore? It just doesn't work. Okay. All right. If this makes a noise when I set it down, it's not my fault. Hello? Oh, it's even louder. Okay, so as you can see, all I have is the, uh, the files here in this implementation. It's just, I'm not fabricating this. This is just the um, main.go file. That main.go is the entire server implementation and you know, your server implementations for a microservice don't really need to be any larger than this, uh, at least not typically, or at least not significantly larger. So, oh crap, Am I, I don't know if I'm on Wi-Fi at the moment. If not, I'll, I'll just disable modules. If you're familiar with Go modules, this is just returning it. Okay, it worked, so that's great. So, you can see we have the built server binary now. And basically then I'm going to take my grpc curl command, copy and paste it. Okay, so as you can see, this is actually working and it's all on the wire and it's gRPC and it's 100% Go based in terms of syntax. So if you were ever afraid of picking up gRPC because you didn't like the syntax of protobuf or you didn't want to bother learning it, I can tell you now you don't have to. That's what's really kind of nice about this. Um, anyways, so, all right, so let me go back to my uh, presentation go through this. All right. So what I'm going to do very quickly is to just show how you, to show kind of the end-to-end -end flow of how one goes about actually adding an API. I'm going to show you how quickly you can actually add this from the gunk definition, run the gunk generate command, and then basically do the uh, implementation inside the server. So I, I just want to point out that, you know, all of the locations are completely up to you. This is just how I define definitions. I put my definitions within a V1 folder uh, and then the name of the uh, API service basically just to kind of keep them collected. So this is the, the same file from before. So what, we're, what I'm going to do real fast is I'm just going to use a hello uh, one that just returns basically a string 
uh, for you know saying hello to a user. You know, look, this is obviously a you know a, a silly hello world example, but I, I'm sure you can extrapolate how you would you know then use this for a much larger implementation. All right, so that's all I had to do to define it inside gunk. Everything else will be picked up automatically when I run, go, uh, when I run gunk generate. Oh wait, I need to actually define those, those two messages, which is hello request and hello response. So I'll do that quickly. So those are just gonna be struct types instead of message types in protobuf, and I'll show you how that's defined. I hope I got that typed right. It's very hard because this is not, I'm not able to mirror the display for some reason. Sorry, if you're not familiar with what that is, is that inside that tag, you basically, it's a requirement of protobuf that you have to define the field number that's assigned to the on the wire protocol, uh, you know, sorry, on the wire data transmission. Don't worry about it, it will just add it for you. I could have actually just run gunk format, but in the interest of time, I, I just want to explain what's going on there. Uh, gunk format will automatically add that to your fields if it's not uh, defined and it'll give you error messages, for example, if, uh, you know, you're if you have overlapping numbers. Okay, so you see how quickly gunk generate actually ran and you can see that before when I was running it in the project root, uh, you know, it gave me an error message because I was missing those fields, but now I run it inside this directory and it still works correctly. And so the assumption is, is now that the, those files will have been updated and uh, we can basically check that with Git. So as you can see, well, I, I think I have a Git ignore on the updated files, but uh, whatever. So I'm running go build now, and as you can see that everything propagates correctly. It's just now that that uh, hello request message is, and sorry, that hello API is now missing. And if I do go build now, it just is telling me that my server type, which needs to match that API service interface, uh, we just need to add that method. So let's do that real fast.
I flipped the fields accidentally. Okay, so that should work. So just to show you then with gRPC URL, So I, I didn't pass a parameter for it, but I just want to show you that I very rapidly, quickly, fully implemented an end-to-end -end API. And if you had defined this, for example, in gRPC Gateway, it would now be available on your ser service. So I, was, I, I realize that this is problematic, and it's, apologies for not going faster, but uh, point of, you know, proof of concept here. So uh, that's uh, adding the endpoint. So there's a bunch of other cool features with it. Uh, you can convert your existing protobuf definitions into this you know, go-derived syntax because there's a one-to-one -one mapping. And by the way, I'd like to point out that even if you don't want to convert existing protobuf definitions to this, you can still use gunk to generate your code uh, for, you know, for Go-based projects, basically, because it will work with existing protobuf definitions in the exact same way as long as they sit on disk in the same uh, kind of package semantics that you use for standard Go packages. Uh, there's gunk format, and eventually we're going to be adding gunk extract. So gunk extract will, um, instead of having to define any of this inside of uh, you know, gunk definitions, what we'll do instead is that you can just write your code uh, you know, as a function member on a type, and it will just basically uh, extract it for you, if that makes sense, and then generate the gunk definitions for you based on your go on your go implementation. So gunk is still super early in development. Uh, it's been around. It's been in production for well over a year. Um, but what we're looking to do eventually is is to essentially standardize those metadata uh, options that Protobuf has and basically allow for inline definitions in real Go code as opposed to you know, having it with uh, gunk uh, code. And eventually eliminate the need for proto-C at some juncture, but that's really low priority. So that's it. Um, so we're hiring, again, uh, looking for really good engineers. If you're interested in any of this kind of technology, you know, this is literally what we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I'd love to talk with you. We have a booth upstairs, so please, if you have a chance, come